My name is Jamie Mitchell. I'm the founder of All Together. Welcome to this first session uh, at our very first summit. Before we start today's session, I wanted to just give you an introduction to All Together and this event. Uh, founded over a year ago, uh, All Together is here to support small businesses survive and thrive uh, past COVID and to build back better. We've united some of the country's leading CEOs. Uh, to offer pro bono support and advice to small business owners and CEOs. Um, we're very proud to have had over 100 volunteer advisors who are all CEOs or former CEOs themselves support 250 businesses in our first year uh, and with thousands of free hours of advice. Uh, and today we're delighted to be reaching uh, with this event thousands more businesses. If you want to know more about Altogether, please just visit us at altogether.company. You can apply for support or you can volunteer as an advisor. Um, we are always on the lookout for new help. In terms of this summit, we wanted to do something different uh, to your sort of typical lockdown webinar. We wanted to recognize that we are emerging out of a health crisis, uh, but we are still struggling, potentially uh, really struggling to build back better. So our three things summit was designed to offer concrete and actionable advice from uh, uh, our CEOs. So each of them, uh, whether speaking or a panelist, are going to offer their three pieces of advice to you uh, as you and your business look to build back better digitally or in the workplace or sustainably, uh, which are the three sessions that we're covering today, tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, before I hand over, I do want to say there uh, uh, kind support in this event and uh, as volunteer advisors at all together this past year uh, to our partners uh, both our long-term partners director banks cms and investec with whom our not-for-profit would not be able to survive thank you but to also to our event partners bgf q5 and grayling for helping us put this event on a uh, little housekeeping uh, there are two ways to interact with this event the chat area is for you to chat and share ideas uh, and discuss amongst yourselves, please feel free to do so. If you want to pose a question to the panel, um, Gabrielle will leave some time at the end for questions. They need to go into the Q&A. Um, and if you're going to post on socials during the event, and please do, uh, can you use the hashtag three things summit, spelled out in words, please, three things summit. Okay, I'm gonna get out of your way and hand over to Gabrielle. Gabrielle was one of the first volunteer advisors to sign up. Um, uh, she has uh, supported us hugely this year because she's also a non-exec director at Altogether. She's a serial entrepreneur, a CEO, an expert in e-commerce and digital transformation. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for all your support and for chairing our panel today. I bid you farewell, and I'm going to join the audience and hand over to you. Thanks so much, Jamie. It's been a huge honor to be a part of All Together, uh, both as an advisor and, and in working with you and the team more closely. And I'm really thrilled to be sharing inaugural Three, Three Things Summit, which we know is gonna be uh, an annual summit and will continue on forever. Why not think big? Anyway, uh, our, our focus today is on how to build back better digitally. And so as we know, COVID has accelerated a shift online in almost every industry and made all of us learn to use new digital tools for work. So what should CEOs be doing with their new digital channels as the economy reopens? And how can we embrace our newfound interest in technology to make our organizations more productive and to make our relationships with our consumers that much stronger? So I'll introduce our panel, um, who's here with you today, who, whose faces you can see. And then we will uh, go to our keynote speech and then rejoin the panel to hear their three things. So first, I'd like to introduce Anthony Fletcher. In his own words, Anthony is attracted to new stuff like a moth to a flame, even when rationally, he knows the current stuff is far more proven and quite frankly, probably better. Um, Anthony has been with Grays for almost 11 years, uh, eight of them as CEO before stepping down last year. And he previously worked in various roles in Innoc um, at Innocent Drinks, including Innovation Manager. Thanks for joining us, Anthony. 
Next up, we've got Jill Easterbrook. Jill's been a business leader in omnichannel consumer businesses for most of her career, um, most recently running Bowdoin. And on a number of FTSE boards, including Auto Trader. Nice to see you, Jill. And finally, last but not least, most certainly, is Tobin Ireland. At his core, Tobin is a mathematician and a marketer. And following his digital media career at Sky, AOL, and Vodafone, he's now an investor and entrepreneur in both D2C and data businesses, having been the founder, chairman, and CEO of two leading VC-backed mobile ad businesses, AdBrain and SmartPipe. And now I'd like to, to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, William Reeve, who uh, has recorded the keynote for us. William Reeve is the CEO of Good Lord, chairman at Nutmeg and non-executive director at Dunelm. He's an internet focused on a hugely successful love film and secret escapes. There's not much about digital that William Reeve doesn't know. So over to William. Hello, I'm William Reeve. I'm Chief Executive of Good Lord, the leading software platform for the UK's residential lessings industry. I have over 20 years experience in the tech industry in the UK. I co-founded Fletcher Research, lovefilm.com and Secret Escapes, all of which became the leaders in their field. And I've been involved with other leading tech businesses like Grays, Nutmeg and Zoopla. But I'm here today to offer three pieces of advice for Chief Execs as to how to build back better digitally as we emerge from lockdown. So my first piece of advice is to look for the lockdown positives. I know lockdown has been a real struggle for many. Often it's felt more like living at work than working from home, but it's also created opportunities. Many of us have been able to recruit from all over the country. We haven't uh, wasted time traveling and we've been able to be at home for the kids' bath time. So, while lockdown has been a bore and none of us would have chosen it, remember to look for those positives and learn from them. And as we get hopefully uh, able to leave lockdown behind us and start to return to offices, we're not gonna be returning to uh, office life as it was before the pandemic, before we'd even heard of COVID. Before lockdown, many of us would have found ourselves working from home and dialing into meetings and dialing in was, let's face it, crap. It was crap for the, person dialing in who couldn't necessarily get the nuance of the meeting, couldn't make a full contribution. And it was crap for the people in the meeting, uh, in, in, the, in the physical meeting, uh, having some disembodied squawk box trying to participate. The buzzword as we get back to the office will be hybrid working. Hybrid working, trying to incorporate the best of what offices have to offer and what working from home has to offer. Offices have advantages for building relationships, uh, cross team collaboration, the serendipity and creativity that comes from um, people rubbing shoulders with each other. But working from home has advantages too. You can get your head down, you can make calls uh, uninterrupted, you can avoid distractions, and you don't waste time traveling. So the trick with hybrid working will be um, finding the best of both worlds. Uh, and the, the real issue is going to be those making sure those people who are working from home don't feel like second class citizens. So my second piece of advice is to abolish meetings. What do I mean by that? Obviously, meetings are a staple of the business world and that most businesses can't, can't, can't function without them. But physical meetings between colleagues and people who know each other well have been proven now to work just as well remotely, just as well on a video conference as they do face to face. And if you continue to use remote working tools like Zoom for running those regular scheduled internal meetings, it'll enable people who are working from home not to be second class citizens, and it will enable you to be a more attractive workplace for people all over the country who would find having to work in your office uh, impossible even. So let's, um, let's do our best to embrace the best of both, create a level playing field and abolish meetings. Um, and thirdly, now that we're working productively in some hybrid working arrangement, what are we doing in particular? Well, I'm reminded of, a, of a, a recently with all the news about Prince Philip RIP of a great quote of his, which was what didn't get built by nature, got built by engineers. Where does that leave the rest of us who aren't engineers? And building um, software has always required 
um, some some uh, programming skill, um, whether you're a teenage computer computer whiz or uh, or you've picked it up later in life. But the good news is that these days you don't need to be a software engineer to build digital workflows. And my third piece of advice is to check out some of the tools available that enable very sophisticated digital processes uh, to be built without any uh, technical skill or software experience. Tools like Zapier, Automate.io, or IFTTT, if this, then that. These tools enable very sophisticated processes to be built uh, by people with, with almost no technical uh, knowledge or experience. Most businesses these days have a social media presence, for example. And imagine that you want to uh, automatically uh, capture leads coming in, for example, from Facebook uh, and feed them into your sales um, team and your sales database. Tools like automate.io will make that very simple for you. Or perhaps you're using Slack uh, internally to communicate uh, in your business and you'd like any uh, social media posts about your brand to be automatically put into a Slack channel uh, so that you can quickly see what the uh, social media uh, is saying about your brand at any one time across everybody who, who's, um, whose job it is to um, be aware of that. Again, tools like Zapier make that very straightforward. Or perhaps even you've got a venue with indoor and outdoor tables and you want to avoid the outdoor tables taking reservations when it's raining, when it's forecast to rain. Well, if this, then that, again, makes that very straightforward. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to have been a teenage computer programmer. Uh, you don't need to become an expert in artificial intelligence if you've got natural intelligence, because these tools are there to enable clever people um, to do very sophisticated things um, very simply. So that's it. Those are my three pieces of advice. The first of all, first piece of advice was look for the lockdown positives. Uh, the second one was um, abolish meetings of, to help avoid your colleagues who are working from home becoming second class citizens. And thirdly, check out some of those modern tools like Zapier, Automate.io, if this, then that, which really make building digital processes almost literally child's play. Good luck. Okay, well, uh, uh, rather <laughs> cut a tiny bit short, but uh, that's all right. We will we will move on. Um, and we have summarized those three points in in the chat. So thank you. William Reeve for, for joining us today, albeit uh, virtually and uh, on video. So let's listen to what you guys have to say in terms of telling us what are the three things CEOs really need to think about in order to build back better digitally. So Tobin, why don't you hit us with what you've got? Okay, thanks. Um, well, my three things are the three M's. Uh, my micro, macro, and media. Uh, and I think this sort of affects both uh, B2C businesses and B2B businesses, but obviously this year has been a huge amount of uncertainty and change. Uh, but the first thing is if there's ever been a time to understand your customers better and to be more data-driven than this has been it, and the speed of decision-making uh, when, when the, the landscape and the environment is uncertain becomes really a, a source of massive competitive advantage. Yeah? Um, I'm involved with a company called Love Honey, which is a uh, online retailer of sexual happiness products. And believe it or not, it took us about four to six weeks to realize that the, the lockdown was going to be a positive boost to the business. In retrospect, that feels a bit silly now. Um, but we were to close down and, 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 this, and we ended up being, you know, sort of 80 percent up year on year. Uh, equally, I'm quite close to the team at Oddbox, and um, I don't know if Deepak and Emily are on the call. Hi, if you are. Um, and they they obviously had a massive boost in those first few weeks of, of lockdown. But to understand the cohorts and the customers that they were acquiring and making sure that they were going to be valuable long term customers uh, was a real, real uh, area of focus for them. And their business has done phenomenally well and continues to grow actually faster at the end of lockdown than it did at the beginning of lockdown. Uh, my second one is macro. Um, to, to, to take a little bit of a step back and to read the tea leaves and take some perspective of what's happening in the world. And not everything's gonna be the same. It's not gonna be bounced back to normal, whatever normal was. Um, 
and some things are just going to change more fundamentally and that could mean that you your business has a bigger opportunity that you thought and you should you know accelerate and raise more money and go faster it could be that you're in a category or a business model where you have to delay and wait a little bit and wait for the return of spend and 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 consumer behavior to come back or it could be that um, your business just isn't as interesting as it was pre-covid and actually now's the time to to think about um, you know, using skilling up in other areas or moving the business in other areas. Uh, you know, some simple things like the, 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 the mix of online to offline retail being one of them. But there's also some major big categories that have come out of COVID which didn't exist before. Um, I'm an investor in two businesses at the moment that are capitalizing on macro trends around the pandemic. One is in the pet care industry. So building a D2C brand in pets. And the other is mental fitness and um, people having a lot more time on their hands, but also feeling lonely and detached. And how do we build tools to help people, um, you know, strengthen their minds as well as strengthen their bodies as they get back to the gym. So there's in change, there's always opportunity. But I think, you know, everyone's very busy and trying to make things work. But now's a good time to take a step back and and think about things. And then my third M is media um, and really thinking about opportunities. Uh, it amazed me, like in the first six or eight weeks of COVID, like, I mean, A, the TV buying schedules were already set. So you saw a lot of ads for travel companies in those first six weeks, which was a bit odd. Uh, secondly, like it took about three or four months for any company to creative ad. Uh, Nationwide was one of the first ones that I saw, um, but also opening up to media buying opportunities. So I know the team at Loaf, did their first TV ad after six weeks, um, you know, getting better, better cost of media than they would have done pre-pandemic, but it's it's turned out to work really phenomenally well for them. And TV is going to become a big part of their um, their media mix going forward. And equally at Love Honey, we did our first outdoor ads, very oddly, um, in, in, in the pandemic, mainly because the outdoor media owners were happy to take a sexual happiness ad because there weren't much else going on. Um, but it actually worked really, really well for us. And, you know, we, we've got some campaigns coming out in, in the US and Canada and in, and, and in the UK behind outdoor media as well. So now's the time to be brave, I think, and to experiment and to read the opportunities. Uh, there was a lot of VC in their companies not to spend and to, and to just conserve, conserve the cash. But consumers, it was, it was probably a, a massive customer acquisition opportunity for a lot of brands in the last 12 months and will be going forward as consumer behavior you know, changes and migrates and goes a little bit back to normal, but stays a little bit different as well. So those are my three Ms, uh, my three things, micro, macro, and media. That sounds great, Tobin. Those are great examples too. And I, and I love the end of, you know, above, above everything, be brave. So we'll come back to, to dig in a little bit more uh, to those three things. Um, Jill, what, what are your three things? So I guess the context for my three things picks up from some of the things that Tobin has said. Be a really important year for digital businesses and should be a year of opportunity. But I guess cognizant also that there is a lot of competition. When, when you see an opportunity, people have now started piling in. And then those traditional businesses that perhaps weren't taking advantage of the digital world are doing much more pivoting towards digital. So I think this is the year that you really need to move with speed and really be able to ruthlessly prioritize the things that are gonna make the big differences and ditch some of the things that won't. So my three are firstly around the budget. So what did you do without last year because of COVID? Either because you needed to save money because you were worried that you are gonna to have thought of love honey or because you're forced to work differently so anything that you did without last year think very very carefully before you return back to business as usual and put it back in your budget so good examples might be re-look at that travel budget do you need those sales fairs marketing activity that you did without or did differently entertainment do you need to do some of that stuff um less stock maybe big meetings that you ordinarily have, just really be ruthless with that stuff and don't put it in unless you really think it's gonna add value. The second is similarly on people. So who did you do with that last year and how much did you miss them? A little bit controversial. 
all know that there are those people, equal people that really stepped up and made a significant difference to your business over and beyond that that you expected. So I guess I'm saying go back through your team. This is the opportunity. Work out who you really need, who you could do without, and other new ways of working, which mean you can restructure and be leaner. And then thirdly, for me, it's your strategic um, strategic plans, your initiatives. You know, there's always a lot to do. I think the list is ever longer this year. And I think this year is the year, therefore, to focus even more. How much of what are you doing is really going to make a difference and shift the dial? So I'd take a hard look at your plan. Just one or two things that are going to make a difference, shift the dial considerably in your business, maybe across three buckets. Look at one or two things for the next 12 months, one or two things for, so that's for today, one or two things for tomorrow, 12 to 24 months, and one or two things for two to three years out. And then make sure that you're focusing your resource, whether it's financial or people, on just those things. That sounds great, Jill. Thank you very much. Um, Anthony, can you, can you give us your three things, your three pearls of wisdom? Yeah, look, I, I think it's unashamedly the year of purpose, you know, to energize staff. Meaningfully with other stakeholders. Um, but what I've seen is, you know, how can you get your purpose to resonate with your consumers? And, you know, controversially, maybe someone here would disagree, it's harder than you think. It's important to them, but they don't really want to hear about it or they're not really interested in the way that many people talk about it. So um, one of my th uh, three things is, can you craft your purpose in the same way you would any other marketing message and really understand how to engage with consumers about it? I think my second is, is Amazon. You know, lot, lots of people are you know, selling lots of stuff on Amazon. And you know, this insight comes from my work with Altogether. Um, I haven't spoken to anyone yet who can tell me what Amazon's profit margin is on their product. And sell to Tesco and sell a decent amount, amount of stuff through Tesco and not understand how much money Tesco is making. So I think my second area is, if you're gonna sell a decent amount on Amazon, really understand what good can look like. And I think there's a lot of headroom on learning kind of out there in the community in terms of what can be done. The third one is don't be a tech snob. And maybe there's something in what Tobin said, maybe there's something in what William said, but there's amazing solutions coming on the market and they're cheaper and simpler than ever before. But I found sometimes boards don't like the simple, cheap solutions. Sometimes your CTO doesn't like the simple, cheap solutions. So make sure you're not a tech snob. Um, you know, <laughs> keep your um, eyes open as the world moves on in terms of what That's great, Anthony. And thank you um, to everyone. Let's, uh, I, I will say though, uh, when William said you, you don't need artificial intelligence when you got human intelligence, I still cannot get my head around if this, then that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've tried a million times. I can't get it to work right, but I'll leave that definitely for the pros. So let's let's dig in a little bit a little bit more uh, into, into some of the uh, points that you guys bring up, which are, which are really great. Anthony, you, you discussed the need for CEOs to really understand how the Amazon algorithm works. And, and it's a really fair challenge and uh, an, an embarrassing one probably for a lot of people who do sell on Amazon who, who don't really know. Can you point to any particular place to resources out there um, aside from the D or where could someone go to uh, lift up the hood a little bit on that? Yeah, I think m maybe if I answer that in a slightly roundabout way, uh, let let's use an analogy. If anyone's come from the world of tech and buys advertising off Google, you know it's a real science. You know, organic search, paying for pay-per-click. If you go to one of the agencies these days, you expect them to really know their stuff. And maybe you go to many agencies before you make up your mind, you know, who's right for you. Um, I think uh, the same is true of Amazon. It's just the market is far earlier and there's all sorts of chances and opportunists, you know, flogging their wares. So I, I'd say the answer is you should speak to lots of people. 
but I would ask them the pointed question, you know, there are five major algorithms on Amazon. Can they explain to you exactly how they work? Because if I would go with the people who you believe can answer that question the most clearly, because understanding those algorithms is the way to unlock profitable growth on Amazon. Fair enough. Okay. Tobin, you mentioned um, the use of above the line advertising and that this is a, an interesting time to be brave and jump in uh, because I'd imagine largely because it's more affordable or has been more affordable now than, than in the past. Um, and as it is normally in times of crisis or when you don't want adjacencies next to bad news stories, et cetera. But how, how can you, A, do you think that window is closing? Again, and there's still that opportunity to arbitrage rates a little bit. And B, how would you tell these businesses to, to measure the success? So you say outdoor really worked for Love Honey. How do you know? So, so great questions. And I, I know Michael is on the call today as well, who's the CEO at Bright Blue Consulting, who's a, a, I met through the All, All Together program about a year ago. Um, little did I know he was just about to sell his business and do really well. So I don't, I don't, I don't think I had anything to do with his success. But um, I think it, it comes down to like having the data and the analytics to be confident, right? I mean, there's always going to be optimization opportunities, whether they're large arbitrage or small arbitrage opportunities. There's not many brands, you know, in the world who are truly optimizing their, their media mix. Brand econometric back when I was the CMO of AOL back in 2004 or something, yeah? And hadn't really seen that discipline come into digital so much. And um, this was all sort of pre-digital. Um, but we actually went to Bright Blue on the back of the introduction to Michael and got them into Love Honey uh, to work out the the uh, the you know the historic algorithm which determined yeah you know, which modeled how our different media channels worked against each other and it is different for every brand but what it showed is that we were you know we were way underweight in TV even though we thought we were overspending yeah so with that longer term um, that, that that longer term perspective it you know it sort of shifted our media mix strategy. But the key thing was the ability to, to, to test and learn really, really quickly and to run these algorithms like super, super fast, yeah? So you know, quite often these, these techniques are, are very good looking in the rear view mirror, but not very good looking ahead. But you, know, you really need to be on top of the data and the analytics to really sort of spot the opportunities to be able to make the buying decisions faster, yeah? And I think you know, Loaf is another good example, right? He never would have done TV if, if his media agency hadn't said, hey, it's really cheap at the moment. But as it turns out, it's a really, really effective medium for them to, to raise the awareness of their of their brand. Yeah, how much and, and when is a, is a, is a good question. But it's going to be different for every single brand, and you're you're going to have to do the analytics to to work out um to work out what the right strategy and the right mix is for your own for for each specific brand. I think. Okay, thanks. Jill. I had a question, actually, could I jump in? I had a question um uh, about the purpose thing. Yeah, so. who thinks that and actually destroying brand value by not doing it properly yeah i, I think um you know Grays was lucky enough to be bought by unilever so kind of had a bit had a bit of a front row seat on 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 the debate there and um you know kind of part of what underlies my comment is the you know the comment that a lot of consumers um you know aren't are quite difficult to excite or inform about this you know, especially if you've spent um, significant amounts of um, money doing it. You know, what, what I've, you know, seen work is when the product benefit and the purpose get ever closer together. Um, and that makes it easier to advertise the two synergistically rather than trying to raise awareness of, um, you know, certain elements of your, of your purpose. Yeah, we struggled at Love Honey a bit about like wanting to be seen to be jumping on the COVID, not wanting to be seen to be jumping on the COVID bandwagon and, and capitalizing on obviously a terrible, you know, global health crisis sort of thing. But, um, you know, as it became further through the through, through it, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, consumers were turning to us for, for um, you know, for products that were good for their mental health and their, their sexual happiness sort of thing. Um, you know, the, the one I liked the most was the burger, was it Burger King who told everyone to go to McDonald's or McDonald's who told everyone to go to Burger King, which was a brave decision to do that, right? But it was all about the support of the 
of the hospitality industry, I think, right? And, um, and I think, you know, that came across as an authentic um, sort of positioning around purpose and supporting the economy sort of thing. Right? Yeah, I would say here's a general answer about communication challenges like this. You know, it's worth approaching them in an agile way. So pick your channels, which are very cheap, which connect with your core audiences and try different things. And, you know, that that is trying to do that is is behind my insight that a lot of things don't work quite as well as you think. <laughs> People don't don't want these things advertised to them in quite a few different ways. So I think by doing that, sometimes you can find the way to talk or the way to engage it. And, you know, is it humor or as you say, does it have a authentic ring to it? Yeah. You see, my my controversial comment would be, I'm not sure the point of having a purpose is to communicate that to a consumer. I think your purpose is about driving what you're saying. Um, and so I'm not sure that, that that would be my my main mission with my purpose. My For me, it would be, has it determining what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, rather than necessarily wanting to talk about it verbatim with customers. That's interesting. I mean, it's it certainly, uh, it is an area that has gotten an awful lot of ink and an awful lot of um, attention at the board level in the last year more than ever. And it is going to be interesting to see how businesses take it forward, where the greenwashing lies, where the uh, uh, virtue signaling is versus the, as Jill mentioned, you know, the authenticity of, of true purpose. Matter to customers, but then I also think you have to consider your stakeholders uh, your, as well as, you know, your, your, your employees, uh, your supply chain, all of that. And, and that's part of the bigger picture. But Jill, let, let's stick with you for a second. Um, you mentioned be really, really wary of what you put back in the, the budget. So can you give me an example of some things both, you know, personally and, and some of the businesses you work with? And actually, I'd like the whole panel to, to weigh in on this. What will you not be adding back in? So actually, a good example is a business that I work with that sources from China. Um, and one of the things that had always happened was a huge amount of traveling, as you can imagine, to the Far East on a regular COVID put a big stop to that. Um, but interestingly, there, there's a team in China, a capable team in China. And so what the team over here did is they actually started empowering the team in China to do a lot of what they'd been doing when they were traveling. And guess what? They were great at it. Um, and if anything, you know, the benefit was they were on the ground, they were more local, the more you gave them, the better results we were getting. And, um, you know, we were not using them well enough before. And we were, quite frankly, probably wasting money. And now we're able to move faster and save money. So, of course, some of the travel will go back in, but by no means the level of travel that we were doing before. And interestingly, you know, it's different at different parts in people's careers. So some of our very younger buyers, you know, one of the reasons they're attracted to coming into these sorts of businesses is they love the idea of travel, but actually for some of the more senior people, they've had it up to here, you know, no longer does this sort of schlepping to and from have much appeal. So there is an added benefit in that it's really helping us from a, a, an employee perspective. So that's one good example. Great. Toby? The culture of business development changed as well. When I was running Smart Pipe, I was on a plane like three times a week and, you know, flying to Indonesia for a half hour meeting with a telco sort of thing, right? And, um, and but culturally it was sort of necessary in, in Asian culture. So in New York, everyone's sort of used to just popping in for having a 15 minute meeting, but you have to be around the corner, right? And they're not really interested in having the video call to, to, to do the same thing. So I think that has changed for the better. And, um, you know, it also allows you to, to think more globally. Like I'm working with a design and a development team in India at the moment, and they could be five minutes down the road from me and I'd be having the same level of interaction with them, right? So the, the, um, the opportunity to use, uh, you know, sort of partners and, and facilitating easier global, um, you know, sort of partnerships and everything. I think that's probably a, a real benefit, right? 
for sure. Not, not so good if you're an airline, I don't think. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll still be around, I have no doubt. Um, Just sit in the Amazon theme a little bit, right? So, oil or not, yeah, number one. Uh, Anthony, and secondly, like, why do why do, are all these intermediaries necessary? I mean, shouldn't Amazon just do a better job at serving its partners? That's optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try and comment or or defend um, Amazon on here. I mean, the, the interesting thing on the people I've chatted to so far is when we've discussed the components of the Amazon algorithm. Uh, what they've seen is that their sales data makes more sense. So they go, oh, that's why we, we always thought it was strange how our bestseller isn't the bestseller on Amazon. And, you know, maybe you scratch your head for 30 seconds before getting pulled into the, <laughs> you know, the next meeting. So, you know, I think you have to, you know, data and do these genuine improved things when you, you know, cut it deeply and segment it. And there's a lot of similarities with pay-per-click in terms of that kind of trading mentality and staying very close to the changes in sales. I think the other interesting thing about Amazon is there is a lot of really good software now that you can um, take on board. And definitely for some of the businesses I'm talking to, actually, when they're deciding what marketplaces to go on, the very fact that you can get some, some software that makes you much more productive in your relationship and, and what you're doing with Amazon is, is giving Amazon an advantage, quite frankly, because it's just cheaper in the end to do business um, with them. So when we discuss Amazon, it makes me think of and how Amazon is always really hard, I have found. And you mentioned, uh, Tobin, earlier about understanding your customer, who your customer is post-COVID um, and who came on. So let's, let's imagine that it is like many businesses who have really revved up their direct-to-consumer channel online. Um, and and have an influx of new customers who may have been offline customers but are showing themselves online for the first time, don't know. How, how do you think this, in the businesses you've worked with, and I'd like to hear from the other panelists as well, has that customer, is that customer new, different, or is it a customer just changing channels? Um, have you, what have you found that's been significant when you look at those customers that have come on as a result of, of being in lockdown and channel swapping? So I, th I, th I think it's honestly too early to tell. I mean, um, but that doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't analyze the hell out of it. Right? So, I mean, understanding uh, both consumer confidence and their view of your category and your and the different channels. I mean, we did like seven lots of, of qual and quant research in 12 months in the UK for Love Honey, and we would normally have just done it once a year, right? So we were uncertain about what was going on and how people were feeling. So we went and asked them much more frequently, which you can do really cheaply now. Um, uh, the, um, what are you using cheap? Is there a bit, a bit of software that you just use? Just using like a YouGov survey is enough to sort of, you know, do it at a top level, just understanding the, 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 the sort of trends and, 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 the, and the important dynamics. Um, the, um, so I think it's too early to tell overall. I mean, I, I went to Shoreditch on Saturday. It was nice and sunny. Hadn't been to a shop for a year. So um, had some dim sum and then walked around and just looked around. There were people queuing out. Yeah. And, um, you know, not because they had to do it. Was, you know, they, 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 there is demand out there and retail's not dead. Yeah. Um, you know, I went in to try and buy a new pair of jeans and they didn't have my size. And so instead of waiting or going to another store, which he recommended, I just said, well, I'm going to buy it online now. Right. So. So the, you know, I think everyone's got more used to buying online and um, and that will continue. Um, and, you know, retail will be probably come more experiential and, and you know, you'll you'll do it less frequently, but you'll still want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't, I have any personal desire to rush back to Sainsbury's, right? Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, so. It's experiential, Tobin, don't you miss yeah, it? Well, maybe, maybe I'm not like their target customer or something, but the, um, the, you know, so I think it's, it, it is about understanding. I know the guys that, you know, one of their big concerns was that, you know, there was an availability um, crisis in, in grocery retail, which, you know, meant that anyone was trying to buy food any way that they can. Yeah. Um, or if you look at Deliveroo, I mean, you know, great, you know, surge in demand and is that going to continue on one hand it will because you'll have more people who are familiar with your app and are used to doing it they'll do it less frequently 
than they did you know individually than during the pandemic i'm sure but overall the market's probably grown as a result of more people getting used to and seeing the benefit of using these tools when 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 they're available right so but i, I don't think you know I, I, don't, I don't think now's the time for like accurate predictions it's just you know something obviously interesting is happening in the world and in the world of consumer behavior so you know quickly i think the question in the chat was about you know how do you know, you know if, you, if your board is sort of you know hungry for data you can spend you can overanalyze it as well and sometimes you just have to go with your gut and make a decision based on the facts that you have available at that point in time but you know having the right data and the right analytical skills in your organization has to be more important than ever as as, as consumers move a lot of their behavior online which is more data driven anyway but also just because of the you know now we have learned to know that the world's an unpredictable place right and and um and you know there's money to be made by making fast decisions in an, in an uncertain environment actually i one of the things i would say beware of any because i've been caught out um previously and i'd come in a different way like we have done in the last 12 months just be careful what you're um, what you're forecasting for their behavior for the next 12 months, because definitely that's where I've been stung before, where we sort of actually, when we look at the mix of what, how we've acquired our customers, they have behaved extraordinarily differently um, depending on where and how we've acquired them. So to then, you know, apply the normal rules of thumb that they'll tend to come back at, in this sort of way, this often you'll get this sort of money back of them, I think is just a dangerous thing. I'm sure you're all too smart to get caught out by that, but I certainly have been. I think um, I've, I've seen businesses that have done this. It's a great point, Jill. It's very tempting. and all your metrics are now in a completely different place and they're better than they've ever been and this is our new normal and isn't that wonderful it's really tempting to to think that that will continue in that way uh forever and i think your your note of caution and actually your note of of really understand where they're coming from before you project before you project out that, that it's going to apply to every single cohort or segment is is really well taken I just wanted to direct people's attention to Jamie Harris's um, comment in the chat, which was about, you know, recognizing you know, the, 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 the current state of the pandemic in India and shouting out that if anyone has any contacts out there or who knows how people can donate or do anything to make a difference. I've, my business partner on my pet's business is actually based in Mumbai. Um, tragically, three of her um, her family members have all died in the last six weeks. Oh my god! Uh, it's a real thing that's really happening to real people like you and I. Um, it's not just a story on the news. So if there's anything anyone can do, then please do that. Yeah, it's a really good point, and it is still as we're coming out and world the world is starting to look a bit more normal for us. It isn't that that way in, in a lot of places. So it, it is important for us to to remember that. And thank you. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, which piece of advice that you've heard here today are you going to use? And, and you, may, you may use all of them, but which is the one that you've heard that, that resonates the most for you that you're going to take back to the businesses you, and that, that you will apply personally and professionally? Anyone? I'm happy to go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to have Anthony's um, list of the five algorithms on Amazon because I'm clearly not as up to speed on that <laughs> as I should be so I need like my question would be if you wanted to launch a, a D2C brand and you want to use Amazon as a channel where do you start on learning stuff so I think like learning more about Amazon would be number one for me and the other one like to Jill's point like maybe like a personal balance sheet rather than a business balance sheet that um you know there's certain things and activities and people and and businesses and just general stuff in your life and maybe you know it, now's a good time to be deciding about what's on your personal plan for the next um the ne taking a little bit of a step back and not just trying to go back to normal i'm gonna try and do something um which is a little bit more authentic and core to who i want to be that sounds good anthony 
No, thank you. And of course, I am on all together. So, if, if, Tobin, if you want to book a session to talk about the five algorithms of Amazon, I'm, I'm happy. I'm there. <laughs> I'm in. <into laughs> we'll see how deep you. I can go before I bottom out, which is uh, <laughs> pretty shallow, I, I still fear, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I, I think the big one for me is William and uh, the return to work. Um, kind of starting a new business at the moment, hugely excited about building it flexible from day one. Kind of bringing in exec talent outside the of course you can join because I, I i liked his liked his style uh, i'm going to try some of these more unusual ways yeah i agree there are a couple of things from William. I quite liked the challenge of abolish meetings and what might that actually look like in practice. So that's one to go away and think about. And then the second thing was, I think the automating tools, I think that's to really dig in and, and find some more about. And it's one of those things I've learned in my career. So I've worked you know, at very big businesses and much smaller businesses. And I do think sometimes the big businesses, they can have too much money. They just can spend too easily. They're sort of pound blind. And I love it when you're having to be a bit scrappier um, and you find some much more innovative ways of doing things. So I guess, you know, get scrappy and use some of these other tools. Well, that's... I'm gonna I'm going quickly and ask. Um, we'd love we're going to take questions in in just a little bit, and so please any questions that you have, please put them on the Q and A, and we will um, present them to the panel and get some feedback. So I, I urge you to to keep asking us. Um, I also, Jill, based on on what you just said and also what we've heard earlier, this is going to be really uh, a shout out. I'd love to get from you guys. What are one or two or three of those tools that you swear by? Um, it'd be good to kind of flesh those out because I think there are lots out there, uh, but it's also hard to know which ones are really useful to people. And so my one of my, I think you've got to be using it is Hotjar. Hotjar is super easy, it's well executed, and it's a brilliant way to get feedback, look at heat maps. It's, I do not own any stock in the business, but uh, I should. But it's, it's just, I found it very, very useful um, and very, very quick. So that's one of mine that, that I love. What about you guys? What are some other, either for internal productivity or for external, um, you know, making your digital channels saying, what are some of those cool, cheap, and really good pieces of tech? You said cheap there, you've thrown me. Um, I, I've got all my companies on Notion, um, which is a collaboration sort of workspace tool that um, is pretty flexible uh, and, and good at in demanding, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a really weird pricing model where you pay per project, basically. So even though you subscribe for one business, you have to then pay again when you set up a new a new room so they're obviously doing very well <laughs> um and then and then moving off of mess whatsapp to slack is the other thing that's happened in my rather you know sort of old man life so <laughs> and and is that meant to to be a marker of old age slack <laughs> i think it's just a better way like you know they tend to have like thousands and thousands of messages to scroll through and thousands of Evernote notes and everything so getting them all into a into a into a, a more you know collaborative environment is 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 much stronger. I found it really difficult with the the sort of plethora of, of video tools, hanging out in a Zoom and a Teams meeting and everything, and um, you ended with your whole laptop completely crashed with tools, basically. So I think the fewer tools, the better. But um, I'm sure I'm missing out on thousands of things I should be doing. Notion. Okay. Anthony, hit us. Yeah. I look, I second Slack on. Um productivity, if only because of its slick way of being able to deal a, deal a, a relevant GIF out at speed is, uh, is, is a joy versus any of the Microsoft platforms. Um, look, I, I, I think the, 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 the thing which has really surprised me is actually on some of the more statement um, pieces of tech. So the CRM systems, you know, the, you know, where is Shopify, you know, this year versus even um, uh, two years ago? Customer service, 
uh, my feeling it's um, on, on in my experience is these ones which people can turn their nose at the smaller supp um, suppliers, the cheaper suppliers, the more lightweight suppliers. Um, but time and time again, have been able to was able to run surprisingly complex things on off, on greys, you know, big business, uh, off some pretty lightweight bits of tech. And sometimes they outperformed the multi million pound stuff we'd spent, you know, kind of six years and dozens of engineers and thousands of hours building. Got it. It's a good place to look. Jill? So I'm just, because my memory is terrible, um, I'm trying to remember the, the software that we've put in. That has been unbelievably um, beneficial. Um, and I want to say Celix, but I'd want to confirm. I'll have to post it yeah. afterwards but amazingly transformative. Well, you just said amazingly transformative, but you can't remember the name. You are leaving. I know, but that's me. That's, I just remember the results <laughs> rather than the name, <laughs> if I'm honest. Okay, great. All right, well, we will get the name then. All right, so let me um, turn over to some audience questions and uh, please keep them coming. But let's start with one from Siham. Hi, Siham, thanks for joining today. And what would be the one meeting conversation tip or habit that you would recommend that has the biggest positive impact on managing people remotely? Think about William help us make, make every meeting be on Zoom, even if people are different desks zooming in so that everybody feels on a level playing field. Um, what are some of the ones that that you guys would recommend to manage people remotely? Obviously Slack. This one's, anyone old, yeah. this one's as old as the hills, but don't have one hour meetings. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Anyone anyone who knows me will chuckle, but you know, like timekeeping has been much better, like on digitally than it is in the real world. And, um, but you don't need it an hour for a meeting. I'm always a bit insulted when people put me in the diary for 15 minutes, but that's probably just a, an old school thing. But um, you know, I think if you can have a, a shorter meeting, at least make it 45 minutes so people can go and have a walk. I, I'm a massive fan of a phone call. That's been my new revelation in the second sort of half of lockdown. Like in the first half, it's all about Zooms. In the second half, it's ditched a pile of them and turned them into 10, 15 minute quick calls. Brilliant. We don't need them always. Okay, so when you're doing these, actually, I, I misread Siham's um, question, and I'm really sorry. Her, her question is about what is the conversation tip or habit? And actually, Jill, you mentioned, you know, a phone call, pick up the phone. Um, Tobin, I guess yours would be, and, and Anthony, it's about making it shorter. So it's, it's less of a big production, more snack size and often probably. But is there anything that you're saying that's different? Is there uh, any uh, anything else that is promoting collaboration um, in how you start a meeting or start a conversation or, or plan a follow up? I think the size of meetings is quite interesting, and you know, I, I've 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 been looking at some feedback of um, one of the companies I'm involved in, and, and uh, in in larger meetings of like more than three or four people, then. some personality types or, or levels of seniority to fully participate in, the, in, a, in an online meeting. So it's easier for, um, for the room to be carried by, by the most um, vocal people in the room than it is in a, in a, in a, in a meeting room. So maybe, maybe there's something there about the size of meetings or, or making sure that you know, um, you know, different personality types are, are equally comfortable. And, and you know, I think having a facilitator of a meeting is a really positive thing, right? So the, this idea of having a chairman of a meeting or something mm -hmm. to, to make sure that it's as productive as it can be. Um, Great. I would focus on that, I think, a little bit. Okay. Okay. The, the, the came, came up is chit chat dead. Uh, you know, I don't know how many companies have done it, but you know, quite a few have had sort of social events on to, to relax at the end of the day with your colleagues a bit. Um, the last thing I want to do is spend more time on a, on a, on a, on a Zoom call, but I, you know, I think that doesn't. It doesn't face to face is obviously really important. I, th I think the new world of work will hopefully be, you know, a hybrid model of you know sometime remote and sometime where there's face to face and teams coordinating and and having that chit chat. I think it's super important. I've got an 18 year old daughter. The thought of like being at the start of your career um, 
and not meeting your colleagues is like super weird, right? And like, how do you build relationships and networks and skills and capabilities if you're if you're not actually you know have that face to face and that 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 level of interaction with people? So I think we also just need to be cognizant about you know the next generation of business leaders as well as they come out of COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I move on to the next question from Julia? What are your top tips on scenario planning? Now that scenario, I think this whole last year of scenario planning, we've been doing it in our sleep and also not having any idea what those forecasts or projections are meant to be. But how, how are you approaching scenario planning? Jill? So it depends on the business and um, what are the things what are the downsides to the scenarios? So for example, in a business where um, a big part of your cost base is people, then um, actually you can afford to keep your um, forecasts tight in that if things overheat, you can normally pick up the slack. Um, on the other hand, if it's a business with stock, if you haven't got the stock, you can't sell it. And I think you have to make some, um, but if you have too much stock, that can screw, screw you for a number of years if you get it wrong. So for me then, I think it's, so then I wouldn't be necessarily going for the most ambitious, but I wouldn't want to undercut it either. I'd be wanting to get somewhere sensible in the middle. So that's why I say, I think it depends what resource you're focused on and how quickly you can turn things on and off it really makes a big difference. So each business for me that I'm involved with is really quite different. Mm -hmm. Anthony, you. Thus is kind of complex business, multiple channels spread across multiple countries is we just sorted all of our different um, uh, kind of objectives into uh, different letters. So we had this thing called the U scenarios. And that was like, if COVID goes down and it never comes back up and which ones were the V ones, which might bounce back up and which, which were the things which seemed to be bulletproof, and just, you know, kind of seemed to be continuing whatever. Um, and, you know, that was one side of PowerPoint, uh, you know, all of the major objectives, as Jill was saying on a page and sort of which, which scenarios under what scenarios would you do them and not not do them and uh, I felt that was a very useful way to spend that add on scenario planning um well I'm a bit of a paranoid optimist so it's been great for me because the extremes have been <laughs> yeah sort of people sort of want to listen to the extremes in the last year now all of a sudden so um no the thing I would say is like um the importance of reforecasting as well um like, you know, we, one of the businesses I'm involved with, we were talking about performance versus a budget that was cut in January 2020 all year. Yeah. And clearly the budget wasn't very relevant to the reality of the business and the market. And, but we didn't have the processes in place to reforecast. So we didn't do that. And I think in the short term, that was good because, you know, we were on the right side of the wind and people were feeling positive and it kept people motivated. But I think we all, planning about what was going to happen after this yeah and um and thinking through you know putting some projects and plans in place about um you know the next year and the year beyond sort of thing so i think there's dangers in being locked into a scenario when it's um so more flexibility and more reforecasting i would say okay all right let's go to peter's question we did talk a tiny bit about this, um, and I know that we could talk for hours about this, but let's just do a quick whip round. How do we integrate the digital experience into the physical space? Enhancing experience is a critical enabler. Jill, you've got you, you've got a lot of experience in this. What are you seeing now? What what how to integrate digital into physical? I think really this. for what you know actually the 
the re the physical space was a really critical sales channel whereas actually when i've worked with more digital businesses the physical space is a really important customer acquisition channel mm -hmm. and i think getting really clear on why why have you got that physical space and what's its purpose will allow you then to make the most of the experience you create with it because i think the two things give you a very different set of results you know if you're trying to drive a pile of sales through then you've got to have a pile of stock you don't want to not have the size that tobin wants um, you need to or you need to make it very easy to get it back in and to get it out to him as quickly as as you can. And that's quite transactional and probably not that experiential. But on the other hand, if you're all about acquiring customers, you've got to put your marketing hat on, your brand hat on. How, what What's the reason for getting them in feel your stuff in a way that you can get across the quality of your product the quality of your experience that perhaps it's harder to do online and then that leads you down a very different path mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Anthony what is the, the last um, physical experience that you that you have had that was really effectively complemented by digital um, or maybe none, maybe, maybe this is still the, the, the frontier that needs to be yeah, really. This, this is a long running joke, isn't it? In terms of every year, there's a store of the future, but do you ever yeah. feel that going well, to the store of the future, the future's it, arrived? You well, know? and also, and if you've ever been to any of these stores, the one thing you can hundred percent guarantee is all the digital kit. That ever, ever works. You like it. It doesn't even work on day one and by day three, forget it you know for me honestly the whole building i think it's you know what what did tobin do when he went and there wasn't something there he got out his phone and got on and did it himself so it's sort of that blend it's that it's understanding that hybrid you know you don't necessarily need to be doing the digital things for the customer in the store you can just think about an environment that can allow a customer to seamlessly move in and out which i think is a bit different from perhaps the old way of thinking about it well i would point to um i'm working with a business called souk which is really redefining what offline looks like of really brilliant digital tools that you, you don't know that they're digital. Obviously, they're big screens on, on the sides of the walls, but it it is really uh, breaking apart that model. And I urge anybody who's on Oxford Street, the Tottenham Tottenham Court Road end, to pop in and take a look at, at what it is. Um, it's quite quite interesting. OK, um, thank you for that. I, although, Anthony, I know I asked you, and then you you we, we didn't get to. So I'm, I'm happy to share. I went shopping for jeans. I didn't have the foggiest what the difference between a you know a slim cut and a, a tapered was, and what somebody sorted me you? out. What's wrong with you? Come on. And I, I, I look, I, I, I don't go shopping for jeans very early. COVID <laughs> meant that it had been a very long time, and uh, you know, you know, ended up spending a lot, a lot of money. And I said, oh, is there a multi buy? <laughs> so you look, we're in stock, which I suspect. Um, you know, is, 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 you know, is, is not, a, not an easy thing to do. Um, Are we going to go to the now and reveal which one of us isn't wearing any trousers? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. We are keeping it. We, this is a, this is a, uh, not, we don't have your love honey hat on. <laughs> Here, Tobin, come on. But look, I think, look, the, the, what, I, what I've tended to see is that doing the basics better often gives the best ROI on digital in the store. Yeah. Um, I think, Telling your brand story better through digital, the number of case studies drops dramatically, but it's an exciting thing to consider. Um, but yeah, it's the um, maybe the less sexy invisible. Seems to be where. I think the point, you know, for me, if you're particularly if you're putting on your hat about acquiring customers through your physical retail, you know, have you got that CRM journey actually planned out? And are you delivering on that without, you know, absolutely 100% of the time? And it's amazing how often that doesn't happen. The customers acquired through a physical retail channel just go into the same pot as everyone else, but yet they need a completely different um uh, CRM journey. So I think those sorts of basics get you far bigger rewards at times than um, 
some of the flash stuff that I think we all get. Quite a bit. If I can, just um, one is cash and the other is data. Yeah. So, I mean, 10 years ago, we couldn't get anyone to believe that people would use their mobile phone to buy things in physical retail. And clearly now it's better than touching a card that you have to put back in your pocket. Um, great for the HMRC as well, by the way, because the gray cash economy has pretty much disappeared. Yeah. Um, and secondly, is data like, you know, a, a marketeer's wet dream that you actually know when someone checks into a pub or a restaurant, right? And, and you know, I know we're not collecting that data and using it for, um, for commercial purposes yet, but uh, it certainly is is normalizing the behavior of checking in when you get to a venue. It is. It's it's a really really good point, and we hope that everyone uh, knows how to do it well and and how to use it. All right, let me let me just uh, um, very on the money right now. What are, this is from Philip. What are the panelists' views on local versus international growth during and post-pandemic? Has it opened up the world or made us more insular? Anyone? So I think on the services side, I think we talked about it opening up. I just wanted to throw in there that during the pandemic, we also did something like, like we left Europe called Brexit or something, yeah? So <laughs> actually, it's sort of glossed over the fact that it is actually much harder to do business than it was um, pre-pandemic. Uh, a lot of e-commerce companies are struggling to get things delivered into Germany specifically at the moment, right? Um, but I think we've got another wave of reality coming to hit us when it's about, you know, the, the, the practicality of business running a European organization or a European business. And, you know, different choices will have to be made in terms of infrastructure and teams and financial structures and etc right so all that's been we've forgotten about that a little bit mm. the businesses i work with ha can't brexit has knocked them on their knees um temporarily but still it's really been a, a, a whammy a double whammy yeah. Anthony? yeah i mean it's 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 super contextual isn't it like all like yeah. all discussions on the major growth levers in terms of is it a product vertical or should you go international and you know if so do you go east or west and you know kind of all of that my 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 take is that um um but i'd say the majority have made some quite structural decisions in terms of how they set up their business so they have decided to go for the manufacturer in the Euro european union and so you know a big pain but most of them have grasped the nettle accepted a certain reality has continued and have set themselves up or come up with a new economic model which works thank you and jill any final words no on i mean i would say the same thing i would say the opportunity remains really good but the answers aren't necessarily the same answers you'd have had a year ago so I think that's, you haven't got the same playbook. So you've just got to rethink, um, I think to Anthony's point, you know, how do you get yourself there? And, and I know that, um, you know, Anthony mentioned that a lot of the altogether conversations you've had with CEOs have been around Amazon. And I would say that um, I, I've had a lot that are about just this. It's about, okay, where do we go globally? We know we have to, we've, we know we've got growth uh, to hit. We know that the UK is, is and always will be a small market, again, depending on for what, but it is, it is a real, um, it's always been a question, but now the, the rules have changed even, even more. And so, so the answers to that question have changed as well. And, it, and it's tricky. So I, we have come to the end of our session. So I want to take just a second to thank all of you so much, Jill and uh, for joining us. And it, it's, been, it's been wonderful to hear your perspectives and points of view. And thanks for giving us your three things, uh, which we will all uh, take to heart, I know, and are very practical and useful. And I also want to encourage everyone um, who's joined us today to join us tomorrow. So tomorrow's Build Back Better session is for our people. And it's where we'll hear from Lord Bill Mora, Moria, founder of Cobra Beer and president of the CBI. And he'll challenge us all on diversity and inclusion. 
and Greg Jackson, who will offer us his take on building a brilliant workplace culture post COVID, which I know we talked a little bit about today, but we will be talking about that much more in depth tomorrow. So again, thank you to everyone and to our audience. And here's to the end of the summit day one. And uh, we hope you have a really great afternoon.